Hello, my name is Kevin Hind and this presentation concerns Corno oligopoly. Oligopoly refers to a situation where there are only a few suppliers in the industry. In some instances there may only be two suppliers and in that case we call uh, the market structure a duopoly. There are examples of duopoly in the UK for example the sugar market and also the salt market. Here there are two very dominant providers of salt and sugar respectively and the, the amount of production from elsewhere for example imports is actually quite low. The other part of this particular presentation refers to the work of Augustin Corneau, a 19th century French mathematician who showed that firms can compete on non-price uh, variables, in particular sales volume. And this is particularly relevant for a, a, an understanding of modern day um, market economies. Firms don't always just compete on price, they compete on variables such as um, design, uh, differentiation in terms of marketing, etc. So the point about the Corneau model is that it recognises that in a market firms are interdependent. In other words what that means is that a firm will react to another firm's decisions. Uh, for example if a firm changes its design of its particular product then competitors will react by looking at its design and changing the, the design accordingly. Um, more specifically in the case of the Corno model each firm is trying to maximize its profits given what it believes the other firm will produce. So the firm is producing or competing using non-price techniques. In this instance um, the firms are competing based on sales volume, quantity. And of course that isn't too difficult to imagine. Many internet providers look to use uh, look to uh, get sales based on the number of users so they're trying to sell packages to individual users. Uh, so sales volume is very important in, in the modern business world. The simplest model that we can look at is a duopoly and as I mentioned earlier a duopoly is a, s a situation where there are only two sellers in the market. So we're assuming there are two sellers in the market in the example that we're going to use and that the barriers to entry are very high so there's no potential competition. So we're going to look at actual competition in the marketplace initially using two firms. The best way of understanding how um, Corno operates is to provide a numerical example. So uh, in this particular case we're going to say that the market demand is of a particular type, that the inverse market demand f function is P equal to 30 minus Q, uh, where Q is the output and P is the price. And we're going to assume that the output in the market is made up of the, um, two, uh, the pr output of two firms, firm 1 and firm 2, denoted Q1 and Q2 respectively. We're also going to assume that both firms have equal outputs. So the output of firm 1 equals the output of firm 2. And we're also going to assume that average cost and marginal cost are equal uh, to each other and that they're equal to some value, we'll call it 12. That means in this instance that there are zero fixed costs. So I'm making a lot of assumptions about uh, what the market demand is. It's a linear demand curve, P equals 30 minus Q and that the m average cost equals the marginal cost, uh, that it's a constant amount of 12 and that fixed costs are zero. But as we'll see, this is quite helpful when we want to compare the welfare outcomes of a Corno oligopoly with that of monopoly and perfect competition. I suppose we really ought to get an idea of how uh, we might interpret this particular situation diagrammatically and that's the purpose of this slide. Um, 
here I've drawn a traditional monopoly diagram um, uh, and it's based upon how firm might firm one might actually interpret the situation that it's given uh, using that traditional monopoly diagram and so imagine your firm one and you're faced with a demand curve of, of um, price equal to 30 minus Q so on the vertical axis um, we have price at 30 when output is zero and when price is zero the output is 30 um, marginal cost is 12 so um, where the demand equates with the marginal cost where price equals marginal cost which is a competitive situation then uh, we get um, output of 18 so that would be the market demand if for the for the whole market uh, however let's assume that firm one believes that firm two will produce that entire market demand in other words it will produce the whole 18 units in this market so if firm one believes that firm two will produce 18 units it won't have any of the market left for it so it will produce zero on the other hand if the firm one conjectures that firm two will produce zero okay so what that means is that it's going to act like a it has the opportunity to act like a monopolist and it will produce nine units which is half the um, half the market output um, and that's where it will maximize its profits so what we've done there is we've conjectured about as firm one we've said what would how can we maximize our profits given what we think firm two is doing in the first instance we assume that firm two is going to pr produce the whole market provide the whole market so that would leave nothing for firm one on the other hand if firm one believed that firm two wasn't going to produce anything then it would produce a monopoly output in this case equal to nine units and it would maximize its profits in doing so now as I mentioned we need to express um, the Cournot equilibrium in terms of reaction curves and that's done on this particular slide and it just might take a moment to uh, to say something about this let's go if you remember from our diagram our earlier diagram where we had uh, we were looking at firm one's uh, reactions we said that if firm one believed that firm two was going to produce the entire market then it would produce nothing and you can see this on the um, line called firm one's reaction curve which we've said was q1 is equal to nine minus a half q2 um, because at there when q2 when firm one believes that q2 is going to be 18 it will produce zero on the other hand if firm uh, firm one believes that firm two won't produce anything then it it will believe it will produce a profit maximizing output of nine units so clearly on firm one's reaction curve we've got the two extremes uh, on the q1 axis we've got nine when firm one is effectively a monopolist and um, on where, where q2 is 18 firm one is producing nothing so we've got perfect competition so clearly at uh, an output of nine firm one is producing its most profit because it's in a monopoly situation whereas it when it's producing zero and firm two is it believes firm two is producing the whole market of 18 it's like a perfectly competitive equilibrium and its profits uh, economic profits are zero one well, can do the same for uh, firm two's reaction curve um, and that's also mapped on here so here we've got firm 2's reaction curve which is q2 is equal to 9 minus a half of q1 and it was firm 2's at profit maximizing output depends upon what it believes firm 1's uh, output decisions will be and that's the the functional relationship expressed here in in some form of uh, equation and the equilibrium is where Q1 is 6 and Q2 is 6 so that's known as the Cournot equilibrium and in a previous um, 
the previous slideshow, we've shown how that Corno equilibrium comes about. And we can put um, these particular data points on the um, on the reaction curve diagram. Um, we've said that under collusion, under monopoly, if you like, um, that the both firms will produce 4.5 uh, units of output each, and under competition, both firms produce nine units of output each. So that means that under competition more output is being produced than under Corno and of course more output is being produced under Corno than under Monopoly. And we've said something also about prices. So what we need to do is maybe show that on a Monopoly diagram. In this diagram we are showing the Corno ep equilibrium um, using the traditional monopoly approach. We've got a monopoly diagram in effect here. And if you remember from our um, equations where price was equal to 30 minus Q and marginal cost was equal to 12, uh, when we looked at the numbers we showed that under perfect competition price would equal 12 and quantity would equal 18. So if both firms um, operated in a perfectly competitive, um, in a perfectly competitive way, then we would be at a point like B, where demand was equal to uh, supply, market supply, marginal cost is equal to the price, and we would be producing 18 units at a price of 12. Um, under monopoly, though, if both firms colluded, then we'd be producing an output of 9, both firms are producing 4.5 units each and the price would be 21 uh, in the market. Now under a two firm Corno oligopoly, a duopoly, then we found that the output was 12 and the price was 18. And what we can also see here I hope is that when we compare monopoly with perfect competition and when we compare um, the Corno duopoly with perfect competition and monopoly um, we get some quite interesting results. So when we look at the, the welfare loss from monopoly it's A, B, C. Okay, prices are greater than marginal costs and outputs are lower under monopoly they are un than they are under perfect competition. But under a two firm Corno the welfare loss is smaller. It's area E, F, B. So under Corno, under Corno assumptions where firms are competing on non-price terms, that is on sales volume in this case, the welfare loss falls. And it, it just so happens, because of the way that I've drawn the demand curve, it's a linear demand curve and I've assumed that marginal cost is constant at 12 and there are zero fixed costs. It just so happens that um, when we have two firms competing against each other they produce an output of two-thirds of the perfectly competitive level. In other words 12 is two-thirds of 18. And if we'd increase the number of firms then let's say by one to three firms and had a triopoly then uh, we would find that the um, output under the triopoly would be three quarters of um, the perfectly competitive level. Okay so um, that's 75 percent of the competitive level. It was two-thirds which is 67 percent, 66.6 percent uh, of the competitive level, and it moves to 75% of the um, competitive level. In other words, an additional firm lowers the welfare loss under oligopoly. And if we have four firms, given again given my assumptions, then we get to a situation where the output level for the four firms would be four-fifths of the uh, competitive level. It would be 80% of the uh, competitive output level of 18 in this in this case. 
to make that point um, I've shown a situation when we, if we had five firms operating under our Corno assumptions so five firms would produce five six of the competitive output level and uh, that's 15 units of output 15 is 5 6 of the um, competitive output level of 18 and what you then see is that uh, the welfare loss falls from EFB to GHB uh, so we're, we're now at around about 84% of the competitive level so it doesn't take too many firms acting under Corno assumptions in the marketplace, acting under Corno assumptions in the marketplace to reduce the welfare and th I think that's important, there are important implications of the Corno model because even with non-price competition in the marketplace only a few firms are required for output to be close to the perfectly competitive level it, they can't actually touch the perfectly competitive level but, you know even if you have a hundred firms you uh, still have a uh, you're, you're still a little bit away from uh, the perfectly competitive uh, level um, but it's uh, very important to recognize how small the welfare loss would be based upon uh, the fact that there are just a few firms competing in the market. We've shown a situation where there are five firms um, would bring about an, uh, five sixths of the competitive level in terms of the output. So that they would that five firms competing under Corno assumptions would bring 84% of the output levels that would be available under competition, perfect competition. And that's just actual competition in the industry you know if it's fairly easy for firms to enter the industry then prices could be forced down even further okay then price of course becomes more explicit in the equation in our Corno model price is not ex as explicit it, it's the fact that firms try to maximize their profits given what they anticipate the other is producing okay so um, but if we had potential competition that then that would have some big uh, implications for price in the um, in the market, and we would get welfare losses down even further. And that so we're emphasising the point that the existence of market power per se is not the problem. It doesn't take too many firms to reduce the the welfare losses. Um, it, so it's rather it's the, the abuse of market power or the conduct of firms that matter in the marketplace and that is a, a story for another time